Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at FlexLogix with Jeff Tate, who's going to talk today about the aerospace industry and what's changing there. Jeff, aerospace is, is not an area that we typically think about when we think about a lot of the electronics and, and the chips that are going out in the valley, but it, it is a unique slice of the world. What's different there and how is that evolving? Yeah, uh, aerospace, um, you know, traditionally in the semiconductor business in the 80s when I started was a very big portion of every chip company sales. Today for FPGA chips it remains a big portion. Uh, about 10 percent according to market research reports of all FPGA dollar revenue comes from aerospace chips. What's changing there? What's new? Uh, what's new is the availability of embedded FPGA. The, the missions that they're trying to do in aerospace I don't think are changing much. There's satellites and airplanes and uh, things they're trying to do. We don't have security clearances so we don't know exactly what they're doing. But uh, our new technology can solve some problems that they have. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. So how big is the aerospace market in, in terms of, of where chips are going these days? The aerospace business, I have been told by the head of DARPA that one-third of the dollar value of chips purchased by U.S. aerospace is FPGAs. So it's a significant amount, probably billions of dollars of semiconductor devices, with a third of that being FPGAs. Why FPGAs? I think the aerospace folks love FPGAs for the same reason that many of our customers do, um, and embedded FPGAs. FPGAs are excellent accelerators for certain functions, like encryption, decryption, for example, uh, or uh, neural network processing. Compared to a processor, you can run 30 to 100 times faster with an FPGA. That's why Microsoft is deploying FPGAs extensively in their data centers and they accelerate many of their workloads where FPGAs do a better job. Is the aerospace market expanding or is it just starting to evolve differently? I don't, I don't know, but we're new to this marketplace and for us it is an expanding business. We see that uh, of our business in the next five years, aerospace is not going to be a majority, even though there's been a lot of announcements. Uh, there's earlier announcements in the aerospace business. Uh, we have uh, significant business in wireless uh, base stations and wireless and automotive networking chips, microcontroller and IoT, and a wide range of other applications. But aerospace for us over the next few years may be 5, 10, 15 percent of our total revenues. So it'll be significant because of their adoption of embedded FPGA. Why not ASICs in aerospace versus, uh, they typically are fairly expensive chips. What makes an FPGA better? ASICs are hardwired. So just like with uh, all of our customers, an issue that everybody has, but aerospace has it even more because it takes five or ten years to design an aerospace system and it may be in production for ten to twenty years. Uh, products that are up orbiting the earth today or, or you know, airplanes in the armed forces today, many of those things were designed twenty-five years ago. So over that period of time, missions change, uh, protocols change, algorithms change, if everything was hardwired, then those systems would be stuck back 20 years ago. With an FPGA, they have an opportunity to reconfigure at least part of the system to address what's changing in their environment. So how do the needs of aerospace differ from other markets? Uh, the needs of the aerospace customers are actually very similar to commercial customers. There are not very many satellites built, so obviously they don't have the volume of production. But the chips that they are designing, at least the ones we're involved with, are just as complex and have architectures, in many cases, very similar to what we see in commercial designs. And their level of engineering uh, complexity and their expectations of reliability are, are super high. So they share the needs of, of being able to handle changing algorithms, protocols, and missions. But what their unique needs are is more than commercial customers. When you're putting stuff up in the sky, you really care about weight. That's why we all have plastic cutlery uh, in uh, airplanes these days, uh, why seats are getting smaller. Uh, weight, cutting weight is critical, uh, and especially in things that go further up into Earth's atmosphere. Size and power are related to weight. If you have a bigger circuit board, the thing around it has to be bigger, it's going to be heavier. If you need more power, you need more batteries or more solar panels uh, if it's a satellite. 
So if you've got weight, size, and power, you're heading in the right direction. And integration of components is a good way to do that. And this is not just one chip that's going to make a big difference. There's lots of chips in these devices, right? Yes. So our customers today, if they're designing an ASIC and it was going to be talking to an FPGA, they now have the opportunity in Global 14, for example, to integrate the FPGA into their ASIC. By doing that, they get rid of the package, they get rid of all the surges that was burning a lot of powers, communicating between the two chips, and, and they're cutting their power. So lighter, lower power, smaller size, those are all things that they're big advantages if they're designing an ASIC. If they're not designing an ASIC, they're not gonna go out and spend all the money to tape out a very expensive mask to replace an existing FPJ. This will be for new designs where ASICs are being designed that would have otherwise had an FPJ attached. What about things like single uh, event upsets, alpha rays, alpha, alpha particles that hit a, a chip, for example, and that's certainly much more common up in uh, space than it is down on, on, the, on Earth. What do you do to prevent that? Is this uh, radiation hardening that goes into here? There are uh, today some radiation hardened uh, FPGAs and some radiation tolerant FPGAs with special processing or special design for space applications. Uh, in non-space applications, they have concerns about soft error rates just like our commercial customers do, but they can handle those in other ways, redundant logic and so forth. So we design our embedded FPGAs using uh, standard cells. If, if somebody has a rad hard standard cell library, we can take that and give them back a design that's just as rad hard as the cells that they gave us. We're not radiation uh, hardened experts uh, ourselves. So we can give them an embedded FPGA that has radiation hardening. And I believe the most advanced rad hard FPGA today is like 60 nanometers. Now that we're on global 14, if somebody was to give us a rad hard cell library for that, we wouldn't develop it. We could give them a much more advanced FPGA with rad hardened capabilities. Do you need the same kind of flexibility and programmability that you have in other devices so that you avoid obsolescence, uh, things change, uh, security threats change as time goes on? What our aerospace customers need and want from us is the same thing that our commercial customers want and need from us, other than the rad hard requirement. So uh, they, they have a need for flexibility and reconfigurability because of changing algorithms, protocols, and missions. And in that sense, it's no different. The issue for the aerospace folks is do they use this FPJ chip or do they integrate the embedded FPJ? They never had the option in the past. One of the things that really motivates the, uh, the uh, aerospace companies is that in some cases, the requirement is for US manufacturing. And today, I believe all or almost all FPJ chips are made offshore. Uh, if they need to have them FPGA made in the United States, they now can do it with either Sandia, where we provided a 180 nanometer FPGA for Sandia's proprietary fab, or uh, we also now are developing Global 14 embedded FPGA, which is made in upstate New York. So who's actually doing this? What kinds of companies, What and what are they doing with this? We're working with more companies and government organizations than I can discuss, but the companies organizations that have publicly stated what they're doing so far are first Sandia Labs. They're one of our first customers. We have developed for them a 180 nanometer embedded FPGA using the same digital architecture as in our 16 and 14 nanometer designs. Uh, they described a DAC, their first SOC, Dragonfly, and actually showed use cases of why they uh, designed it. That uh, chip is out of fab and working and they have plans to do multiple devices uh, and we'll be supplying those to other U.S. government agencies on demand. We have uh, an agreement with DARPA. They were executed around the same time. They wanted us to demonstrate for aerospace applications that we could build a very large embedded FPJ. So they asked us to do 200,000 lookup tables on TSMC-16, which actually is the basis for our evaluation board, which we supply to customers worldwide. That evaluation chip showed aerospace companies that they could get very large embedded FPGAs at very high speeds and that we met all of the requirements for IR drop, et cetera. That has then led to a demand for Global 14 because most of the companies would prefer to have U.S. manufacture. And uh, just this week, we announced uh, 
Boeing is our first licensee for Global 14 embedded FPGA. They're in design and uh, we will be taping out our validation chip early next year and they'll be taping out their chip uh, in the first half of next year as well. Interesting market. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Ed.